This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Thanks again for downloading another episode of Doc and Jock. I am the Doc, John Macron. Joining me, as always, my cousin Adam, the Jock Strozinski. Cuz, football's in the air. We got drafts to review. Free agency for the Pistons. Some concerns that should have Lions fans panicking right away. Seven days into training camp. You can hear the excitement. Cuz. And it finally came through. I got approved for Michigan football a couple of games, so that's good. Still in the fold there. So we're now turning the corner because football is right around the corner. You and I are not leaving divisions. We're not going anywhere like teams in, you know, like Texas and, and Kansas and teams like that. We are staying here. We're podcasting. We're bringing all the noise. I can't wait to talk about all the things in Detroit sports with you. How you doing? How you living? Not too bad, man. Like Kansas to the Big Ten. Does that make sense? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Not for football. I mean, good. I think we get a free W like uh, Rutgers was. But basketball? Oh, my God. Can you imagine a couple games a year? State Kansas, Michigan Kansas. It adds life for college for basketball. basketball. It's good. Yeah. But for football, it does nothing for the radar. It's a big dud. And, man, Texas politicians are not happy they are, are cracking jokes, making fun of Texas, saying that they, if they're not winning in their current division, their current conference, how are they going to go and match up against Alabama and get their ass waxed? So that was nice to see this all get political. But that's here nor there. College football eventually, I think, in our lifetime is going to go to mega conferences, probably two 32 team or two 16 team or four 16 team. Maybe four However, 16 team. Yeah, something mega where. It can all, where all the good teams can make the money and we can figure this all out. But, cuz, training camp is in the air, football started, and oh my god, I got to get out there every single day for the last seven days, and it's been an amazing, amazing experience. It is well, literally a thousand times better than before. Let, let, let's, let's start here, okay? Because, uh, Lions training camp, like you said, just kicked off, and you've been out there. I want to know the whole kit and caboodle. Walk me through it. Tell me about your day. Like, there are people walking around with pagers that keep people six feet away. Uh, there's, like, different tiers that you get to go into. You've sent me some pictures. Pictures are amazing, by the way. So so kind of walk me through what's going on with training camp and, and how you're loving it, because I know you're loving it. You're freaking rolling around in that Honolulu blue butter. It's way better. First and foremost, my day get, kicks off at 6 a.m. I wake up get ready and out the door by 6.30. I get there about 7.15-ish, get some coffee, roll up into the tent at 7.30, set up, check all the news, make sure nothing's cracking in the NFL or anything like that. Boom, it just it's just like a whirlwind. 8 o'clock, Dan Campbell comes in, he drops knowledge, he makes jokes, he gives quality answers, so you got to pay attention right away because each presser can literally spawn off five articles just from that. So you got to pay attention, and he drops hints that you got to pay attention to out there on the football field. So then I tape it. I I, I break down the video setup. Uh, he's done about 8:15. I get uh, the notes out to people who are writing. If uh, Christian's writing something, I tell him the things I think are best, or I, I, I make sure that there's any stories that could be uh, expounded upon with players or later on. Boom, out there on the field at 8:30. Now first uh, hour. Sometimes first half hour is basically warm up, stretching, you know, just getting the tosses in. Then from like 9:30 to 11, it's full on, baby. The first week was slow with no pads, but you got to see throwing and catching and kind of maneuvering what they're trying to do. Once pads hit, cuz it was legit crazy. It was like everybody's eyes lit up in the internet world. Readership tripled in the same day than without pads. People wanted to see the hitting and then the, the fighting. We got to see drills, tackling drills, throwing drills. Got to see everything, learning more and more what this stuff was called in each situation. And kind of for everybody, because this is Dan Campbell, this is new, the cadence is different. So we get walkthrough, we get individual drills, then we get some tackling drills, individual competition. 
than 11 on 11. And then the period that Jared Goff shines in the best is seven on seven when there's no pressure. He gets to stand there <laughs> and take two steps and throw the football. He actually looks like an NFL quarterback during seven on seven, which has spawned jokes on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast from me. I think everybody's catching the subtle hint that he looks the best when there's no pressure. He has dropped the football a couple more times. The stuff that we're talking about now, look, I hope and, and I, I pray, and I think it's coming to light that you guys are seeing that my observations are not that different than the beat writers that cover the team for the papers. And I have the distinct advantage in that I don't have to have an agenda with my editor. I'm the guy. I just write what I see. And the people are saying, uh, I, and I'll share this story because it's one of the nicest things that someone can really say to you before Brad Galley interviewed Dan Campbell. He came up to me and said, hey, John, what's happening? Uh, we chatted up a little bit. Channel 7 has always been probably the friendliest to us outside of Channel 2. Channel Most 4, definitely. yeah, Channel 4 doesn't even acknowledge us, probably doesn't even know we exist. But he came up to me and said, oh, man, I was doing my prep and I read a lot of your stuff. He goes, your stuff is genuine and I appreciate it. He goes, you're doing good stuff. He goes, keep doing it. And I said, oh, man, thanks. I said, keep reading. I'm like, you, you read it? You keep reading more? He's like, yeah, absolutely. He goes, you can tell it's just genuine. And you know what that meant to me? Good. It, it meant to me uncensored unfiltered, not biased. I just write what I see. And it's not in a way where I'm writing like, oh, you know, uh, Jamar Jefferson hit the C gap and then tried to do a cut. It's just basic football knowledge for the average fan. And that's all I'm trying to do is get as much information out as fast as possible. Because literally at this point with five other talented writers out there, and you got the likes of Jeff Risden, who's super talented. The other bloggers out there are super talented. If I think it, probably 20 minutes later, it's already out there in the interwebs. So it's just I'm in the mix, and the information literally, as we record this podcast, I could literally write 10 more things. But I'm keeping balanced. The blessing of it now is that I'm done by the players. The practice ends at 11. Players are done at 11.20. I can be out the door at noon. So that way, this allows me then to get my psychological life on by 2 or 3 o'clock, write a couple of things, and be done with football by 3. But because we got to talk about it, and I'll tease it, Dan Campbell might have made his first coaching mistake as evidenced by some changes now that were made to the schedule starting Thursday, Monday. So we'll talk all about it. But the first observation is the defense is better. They're more opportunistic. They're getting to the ball. They're covering receivers. Now, of course, they're covering Lions receivers, but they look like they have their head in the game. They understand what's going on. They're together. They're unified. They are working with Aubrey Pleasant. They're working with Aaron Glenn, and they are working to try and turn around a situation last year that was just an utter disaster. It can't be here's, worse. Here's, here's a question for you. Is, are, are the, is the secondary looking better because there's a bit more of a of an emphasis on on getting a push and collapsing the pocket from the guys up front. I mean, we went from a a defense that was historically bad and had no motivation to apply any sort of pressure to the quarterback. So your quarterback could sit back there. You remember Dak Prescott sat back there. I think he had like 14 seconds. He said he went through yeah. his reads twice oh before he finally found his receiver. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the defense that that Matt Patricia was trying to run. Counted on guys basically lining up in their gap and staying in their gap and staying in their lane. If you were if you were a cornerback or you were a part of the secondary, you basically had to man cover your guy and not not let him beat you. Which it, it's hard for for cornerbacks and for the secondary. Usually your secondary is undersized compared to a wide receiver. Wide receivers usually come in north of six foot, while your your cornerbacks are usually about as tall as me. And I'm not a very tall guy. I'm I'm right there about five eight five nine. So it becomes a little bit of a challenge. Are we seeing more of an emphasis put on, on the guys up front being more disruptive in trying to, to push that pocket? So here's the thing, and Dan Campbell has been forthright and honest. Tracy Walker, linebacker Anthony Pittman, they've said the same thing. The scheme is just better for everybody around, which mm -hmm. means Anthony Pittman, which was revealed during Dan Campbell's media session on Monday, I believe, he said he went to Dan Campbell because everybody's noticed, whoa, Pittman was on the practice squad. This guy's coming out of nowhere, making picks, making plays. He's in it. He's flying all over the place. He looks comfortable. Dan Campbell was asked, like, what's the deal? What he could, you know, this guy spent two years on the practice squad. Where's this coming from? And he said, Pittman went to Dan and said, look, I think my natural 
position is inside, inside linebacker. I think I understand the position better. I can make more plays. Dan just said, all right. And that's what Tracy Walker has said. In that, last year, you would get a sense. And I think a lot of times the way in which Tracy Walker would tell us last year was, look, I'm not going to complain, but this is, it is what it is. But what the real truth behind his message from last year and the year before was, we are not put in the position to succeed at the highest level because our coach says, do this and master it. And the players would say, yeah, but if the, if, if there's a wrinkle here and I can get inside and, and push off help to Will, uh, Will Harris, let me do that. And, and Matt Patricia would absolutely, until probably two and a half years in when it was too late, he was so inflexible mm. that he just kept saying, do this. And he kept saying, master it, master it, uh, fundamentals, you know, master it. And, and by and large, the players, and it, it'll be debated because I still think that Matt Patricia, if he could have found more allies, might have been able to get it done. But in essence, the, the players said and, and figured out and said to themselves, and it permeated over a couple of years, we don't believe this scheme will put us in a position to win. And you saw it late in games. Now, they did perform once against Kansas City where they were one of the teams when the, when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl to limit Patrick Mahomes. But it was too, too, you know, too, not, it wasn't displayed as often as needed to have any level of success. In this situation, Aaron Glenn and Dan Campbell are saying to these players, hey, what is it that will make you succeed? And, and yes, we have our principles, but we will blend in what you can do to make this uh, a situation to give to give us a better team and and, and a happier players. And now it's fresh. The players love Dan Campbell. Cam, uh, Tracy Walker was clowning around with Dan. And, and and unfortunately, it might not be fair. It might not be right. But bottom line, you can just see the difference visibly, a hundred percent across the board. Because Dan Campbell suffered with the players, he did the up-downs, he played the game, he has a brace on his knee or a wrap on his knee, he's had surgeries, he's had the pain, he knows the rigors other than Matt Patricia, who was riding around on a motorcycle looking like a dictator. The players just couldn't buy into that. I think that going forward for the Lions, if anyone's listening, hire coaches that have played the game because the players, I think... When you walk in a room and say, boys, yeah, I know what it's like, but uh, we got to get our asses up. we got to do this. They instantly listen because he played the game. He talked to Bill Parcells. He understood what training camp looked like. He understood being a journeyman so he can understand what a player is thinking. And you see it right away. Now, problem, though, and what I alluded to earlier is the talent level just might not be exactly where it might need to be just yet because – you can see the foundation of what the Lions are doing, but the execution on offense is not as crisp as you would think. It's check down, run, it's like uh, 11 out of 11 drills. It's run, run, run to Jamal, run to Swift, underneath to Jamal, pass. Now, here's where the complaints are because, look, let's be fair and remember the headline. you got to read every word of a headline. My headline that talked about the offense was, Lions offense beginning to show signs of a red flag, which means what was observed by me and all the media was a play developed and Goff sees a check down option five to 10 yards out. That's safe. Trojan condom safe. He sees that. He looks downfield and Brashad Perriman is 35 yards downfield, maybe with a step. Now, the media knows that Stafford would have launched it. Goff, Goff goes condom safe and throws it to the check down. And he's done that a couple times to the point where it's noticeable that, hey, you're in training camp, launch it, see what you got. His deep ball, when obviously things are nice and he plants his foot and, and everything's good, it's nice. He can do it. Problem is, if he starts scrambling little bit of pressure, senses a little bit. He goes to his reads and his ball wobbles and he's putting the ball on the ground. So the things that you saw that might have upset another coach have started to be shown here in training camp. And what everyone's saying is that this offense doesn't look yet through seven days, two days of padded practice that it has big play capability. But the wise fans that follow us have said, yeah, nobody really expected it. 
what they have done, though, they have become check down artists. I think CDA, baby, they can do it. It looks good. It underneath shit should be completed. And if, if the offense is going to be a three yard run, four yard run, Hawkinson underneath screens, Amon Ra, it's going to be different to plod up and down the field. I expect the offense by the time the, the midway point of the season will click a lot better, but mm-hmm. I don't think this is going to be something where if you're going to plunk down money to watch the Lions and be entertained, I'm thinking we're going to be like a 21-17 kind of winning kind of team. If that. Well, he, here's the thing. If that, because they're going to control the ball, they're going to control the game with the run, yeah. and they're going to play defense. So you're not going to be entertained but, by this, but it could work. Th- this is usually what happens, though, when you have a brand new – uh, you know, you're basically changing everything, yeah. and this is usually what what takes place. Defense usually will play a little bit faster initially, right out of the gate, because it is you're getting put in positions to to basically cover guys, and you're just looking to make plays. And as long as you can make plays, it kind of masks what what other deficiencies you might have on that defense. And like like you said, you're watching this, and you're you're basically giving your bare bones general opinion about what's taking place, which is appreciated by everybody. Now, the coach is going to look at it, and the coach is going to see uh, a blown block, and the coach is right. going to see a missed tackle. He's going to see things a little bit more in depth than, than you and I would see because we're not watching the game film. We're watching this take place right in front of us. So as long as big plays are taking place, we're like, cool, defense looks really good. The coaches will be like, that's, that's not good. That's, that's not where we need this to be. And that's fine. As long as, as, long as there are, are turnovers happening and as long as they're, yeah. they're applying pressure – we're excited. Now, the offense, on the other hand, offense usually has to be really crisp. Offense has to be on time. And it's one of those things where you don't have a lot of familiarity with these wide receivers. You don't have a lot of familiarity with this quarterback. You've got a brand new running back in there. You also have uh, a, a right side of your offensive line that is learning to gel with the left side in the center of the line. So you've got a lot of a lot of new pieces that all have to kind of come together. And and again, it's offense is all about timing. It, it is it is knowing when your when your wide receiver uh, is going to make that break and when he's going to be open. When is he going to have his head turned around so you can hit him in stride with that ball? And Jared Goff probably just doesn't have that right now. I think the offense will probably be the biggest hindrance to this entire entire team for most of the season. I don't expect oh. the offense to really get going until probably somewhere right around the, the midway point. And by then, it, it'll, it will probably be too late. And I'm not saying that oh. because it's Jared Goff. What I'm saying is it just takes time, and you're kind of on the clock right now. You know, games are going to be starting in, in approximately a month. Uh, I think, what is it, like 20, 24, 25 days or so? Games are going to get started. And I don't know if that's enough time for, for Jared Goff and for his wide receivers who, look, me and you both agree that the, the depth at wide receiver and, and your quarterback aren't the strongest in the NFL. Uh, they are probably somewhere in the bottom third of the NFL. And maybe they surprise us. Maybe, maybe they come out of the gates and, and they're hot. I just don't expect it. And I don't think fans should expect it, especially when you're installing a brand new system with a brand new quarterback with, wide receivers that are average to subpar, I think that's a fair assessment. So I, I think the offense will look a little bit out of sorts for most of the season. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. I mean, you're not anticipating this team to, to win this season, are you? No. I, I kind of got my fandom up, but I, uh, it's starting to look like a 6-7 win team. Mm-hmm. But, like I said, uh, talent-wise, but if, if you know, teams get hurt – Basically, like we've always said with the Lions, if things fall well where other teams come in hurt or they're not playing well, the Lions could surprise a couple people. But, yeah, five, six wins, probably max, which I think everybody understands in the organization because it's a retool. They have to sell hope now, but they're going to overhaul this roster with with two first-round draft picks in the next couple of years, and they will retool it in a way that's successful. But for this year... Yeah, it's going to be some ups and downs where you think, wow, this team's great. And then you're going to say, oh, my God, this is like the, the most god awful thing ever. But yeah. but because I want to say, I think Dan Campbell made his first uh, NFL rookie uh, mistake here. I think yeah, he got get back a, to that, I, I cut you off and I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's, it's no problems. You, you made very, very, very solid points. Dan Campbell got himself some loving with the physicality of the hitting and the pads being on where he said, you know, in his 
Tuesday press conference, look, I want the guys to be at the point where they're going to brawl, not to actually brawl, but to be so ramped up where they want to be hitting hard. And obviously the rookies got into it that everybody loved. Everybody was amped up. You could see that sense like, yeah, hitting. Everybody loved it. Everybody was excited. But on Wednesday, they ramped up the the tackling drills. They ramped up the tackling physicality. And seven guys left the practice field. And Swift left. Swift left with a – He's going to be, I think most guys are fine, but a lot of guys did not handle that well at all. Levi, Onwuzurike, you had uh, Jerry Jacobs who was playing well. Uh, check the report there at SI All Lions. One of the highlights of the situations was seven, eight guys. Dude, it's day two. What are you doing yeah. having these guys get that fired exactly. up? Exactly. You got to keep the harness on them, keep them reined in. Exactly. Their I body's that- not prepared for it yet. Exactly. And it became like a, you know, two paragraph bullet point where you're like, God damn, seven, eight guys already got dinged up. And I think he ramped it up a little bit too fast because of his excitement level. And but you're starting to see instant changes right away, which gives me the sense that the players talk to him because today's practice on Thursday is a walkthrough. Now, there will be no tackling. And Dan Campbell has adjusted the schedule uh, because it was every day at 8.30 practice, Monday's practice now following the weekend. Friday will be a practice normally. Saturday's at Ford Field. Monday's practice now is at 2.30. So today's practice on Wednesday, as we're recording this, was not good. It was sloppy. It's kind of like one of those ones where the coach looks at the film and goes, what the fuck, guys? What the hell are you doing? And it was one of those things where I think the players went to him and said, I think this schedule – you know, probably t- tires us out a little bit to start practicing at 8.30, and we're not ready to ramp it up just yet. So I think he listened and he adapted. We will see how this will play out. So stay tuned throughout the day Thursday because reports are going to be coming out as to why the decision was made to have a walkthrough on Thursday. And it, he's going to tell you because we probably fired it up too much. The guys are tired. He'll tell you. I think he, he's not going to sugarcoat it. He's not going to bullshit everybody. So stay tuned to SIL Lions and anywhere your favorite place to, to download and, and find Lions content. But he, I think he fired it up too quickly, got a little excited, and now he's going to rein it in. And that's where it is, is where you got to be professional and, and keep your guys in check. So that's number one. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's a terrible mistake because a lot of these guys, it wasn't ACL, it wasn't hamstring. It was probably dinged up, you know, pinky here, sore thigh there, you know. You, these guys are big dudes, and, and they're hitting hard. So, like you said, they're not used to it just yet. So um, they were walking out. <laughs> Everyone's head was on a swivel like, damn, uh, there's another player standing off to the side. So we will see what this all means going forward. So stay tuned to Detroit Sports Podcast and SIO Lions as we bring you as much coverage as humanly possible of this massive, massive training camp. Now, I know people are paying attention to the Lions, but God damn. People always ask me, why are you writing so much shit about Stafford? Well, guess fucking why I'm writing so much shit about Stafford? Because you guys are fucking reading it. It is unbelievable that I can write a simple article about Stafford throwing an interception to Jalen Ramsey in training camp and and cause that was a day's production. That was one full day's production of work for one article. I didn't have, If I stopped the next day, I would have met my quota by a lot. I don't have a quota, but I have numbers that I want to meet myself. And if, if I wrote that one article, I could have took the whole other day off. So that's how much you guys are paying attention to Stafford, which I love. I don't mind. I don't mind writing that Stafford's this and Stafford's that because, guys, yes, we are getting the Rams draft picks. So it is perfect for someone like me to pay attention to Stafford. It's not an addiction. It's a attention to how the Lions will fare because if the Rams are awesome, the Lions pick will be in the low 20s which sucks, if Stafford hurts his thumb, which keep banging it on the helmet, baby. Keep finding a way to get hurt. It's good for the Lions because then if you get like a 15 pick combined with your 10th pick, because we're talking boner jam city now. So we have to talk about Stafford. So you will see Stafford coverage. Uh, Look at the other blogs. I'm not the only one. The others wrote about Stafford and Galladay getting hurt. So it ain't because they love Stafford. It's because you all are reading it. So don't tell me, you know, I'm telling you again, most of my answers are the same and you guys read it. If you say, why are you writing this? I'm writing it because you all are reading it. 
if y'all didn't read it, I would instantly stop writing it because I'm a busy man. I want a podcast with Adam. I want to spend time with the family. I'm not trying to write shit that 200 people are going to read. I want to write shit that people want to that people want, and I'm an expert at that. I know what people want to read. That's my job. So if I'm writing about Stafford, it's because you guys are consuming it. But do you think it's a problem? Are people addicted to Matthew Stafford? I don't think they're addicted to it, but I think for this season and next season, it's one of those things where if you're a Lions fan and you're a smart Lions fan, and I think most Lions fans are pretty intelligent, you're going to pay attention to what's going on with the Rams. Like I'm excited for the Detroit Lions and and the Los Angeles Rams game. And it's not because I get to watch Matt Stafford. It's because I get to check in on what this team is doing, and I get to see how Matt Stafford performs in a different situation. Look, I think Matt Stafford was so divisive here in this state and in this city. He has a lot of people's interest because it's one of those things where if he goes to to Los Angeles and they're able to, I don't know, win a playoff game or win a Super Bowl or – I don't know, just win, be productive and win and and look different than he looked here. A lot of the fans who said Matt Stafford could win a Super Bowl anywhere but Detroit will be right. And all the other fans who basically said Matt Stafford is trash if he doesn't go there and doesn't win a playoff game, doesn't win a Super Bowl, and, and pretty much looks like the upgraded version of what you had here in Detroit can turn around and say, no, we were right. He's trash. It was a he's he's a guy who just can't win. He's not a winner, and thank God that we traded him. So I think there's a lot of rooting interest here, and it's because he split the city in half. Like either you were pro Matt Stafford or you were anti Matt Stafford. There were very few people who did not have an opinion on what Matt Stafford brought to this team and what Matt Stafford did. And I think that is why there is so much interest in him, and I think that is why there is 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 so much of a burn with him. Factor all that in, plus those draft picks that you've got coming from the Rams over the course of the next two years, plus factor in that they're going to be seeing each other this season, plus factor in that our now general manager basically came from that organization. There's a whole lot of ties to what is going on in L.A. with the Rams and specifically with Matt Stafford, and I think that is why there's so much interest with him. But I'll be honest with you. I want Matt Stafford to go there, and I want him to fall flat in his face. I want him to be as underwhelming as he was here. And it's for a couple of different reasons. One, you can turn around and you can say, yeah, it wasn't necessarily this organization and it wasn't just the pieces that were around him that he couldn't get it done with. It's 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 partially him. You know, it, look, he had a Hall of Fame wide receiver in Calvin Johnson. They couldn't get it done. He had a really good defense with a guy like Indomitian and Sue leading the way. Couldn't get it done. There were a couple times where they got to a couple of different playoff games, and he had a chance with the ball in his hand, and he threw interceptions. So he's also a guy who at times lived really, really wild, where he would just be like, look, gunslinger mentality, we're going for it, I'm throwing it, and I just hopefully my guy's there. Next thing you know, it'd be a pick six going the other way, and instead of being down three with uh, with a chance to either kick a game-tying field goal or be in a position to go in and get the winning score, you're now down nine, and they're, they're trotting their field goal kicker out there to kick the extra point. So it, it's one of those things where Matt Stafford has garnered interest from everybody that is a Detroit Lions fan because he's been here so damn long, and everybody has thoughts about him, whether they're good or whether they're bad. And I think everybody kind of wants to get that payoff. They all want to see how it's going to end up. You know what I'm saying? Got it. What do you think? How do you think so far? Do you think that Stafford poised to have a good season real quickly? Do you think that he's going to potentially lead the Rams early on to to some success? You know, I, the way I look at it, right, so when when the article came out about him banging his thumb, I just kind of sat there and shook my head, and I was like, same old Matt Stafford. Like, You're right. It, it was like it, it, every single season here, he had a banged up hand, he had a beat up finger, he had a mangled thumb, he had a, you know, at the end he had broken back. I, I think it's going to be a typical Matt Stafford season. I think he is going to look really great in a lot of games, and he's going to look like he deserved that ESPN ranking of being the sixth best quarterback in the NFL. And then I think there's going to be games where, it was what you got here in Detroit where you're like, how is this guy a starting quarterback in the league? Like, he just threw four interceptions. Yeah, he threw two touchdowns and he threw for 450 yards. 
But, man, he looked all out of sorts in that game. I think it's going to be a, a combo platter of that. And I think by the time the end of the season happens, Matt Stafford's going to be limping into a couple of games. I'm not going to say that he's going to miss games because the dude is a warrior, but it, it's going to be – I think it's going to be a typical Matt Stafford season where he looks great, he looks bad, and by the time it's all said and done, the NFL is a game of attrition. And, you know, he straps it on just like anybody else does, uh, and he gives it his all. But I think by the time the season's rolling around, I think he's going to have either a banged-up hand or he's going to have a banged-up back or he's going to have a banged-up thigh or a messed-up knee. And he'll just come limping in and he'll gut it out. And maybe they win, maybe they don't. But I think it's going to be – I don't think you should expect anything necessarily different. Yeah, maybe he's got some better wide receivers than he had here in Detroit. Maybe he's got a coach who's a little bit more of a, of a better offensive mind than he had here in Detroit. Uh, maybe he's got a way better defense than he had here in Detroit. I think we all can agree on that. But I don't think it's going to translate to him looking like this crazy superstar. I think he's going to probably look better than up average, and, and that's yeah, what it is. Down. Up and down, baby. That's the way it is. You know who's looking to get back up to the top, baby? The <laughs> Detroit Tigers. Chris Illich made some news this week, and finally, I think he knew what the perception was regarding his team, that he was a cheapskate that wasn't going to spend. And I think it, it tied together, too, for us, too, because you and I have ties to Hamtramck. The Tigers have invested along with others to restore a uh, baseball field, and it, it was really nice. I, I, when I saw that, I was like, dang it. If I didn't have to go to the Lions, I would have loved to have gone down there and be part of that media scrum. But finally, Chris Illich said what everybody wanted to hear is that, look, Al Avila is doing a good job. Our timeline maybe is uh, is upon us where it's time for me to open the checkbook. And he said that potentially. Now the key word is potentially he could open up the checkbook and spend some money, which leads all of us to be like, well, how much? You know, are you going to spend $50 million, $100 million? You know, you got some radio guys who are already spending, you know, $15 million on JV, Correa, uh, mm-hmm. a couple a couple hitters. So, one, do you believe them? And what's your best plan in terms of how much? Do you think he needs to really go for it now because of the influx? Or my opinion is take it slow. I think you definitely need a shortstop, one more pitcher. Maybe I'm in the area of not $100 million spent. But get the payroll at least to 125 million. You're at 60, and 30 of it is Miguel Cabrera. So come on with that. Get it to double what you have now, and get some players out here because AJ Hinch has got this team damn near winning 150 games already this year, and, yeah. and, and it's been impressive. So I believe Chris Illich, but I don't believe he's going to overspend. I think he's going to probably get it incrementally up to probably 100 million dollars uh, next year for the budget. Would you say it's safe to say that A.J. Hinch is your, arguably your best player on this team? <laughs> A.J. Hinch is the best vision, the best visionary, the guy that brought the analytics, the, the guy that in-game managing is, is awesome. He's obviously he's, the MVP of this team. He's obviously the MVP and really easy to talk to, gives no bullshit answers. He just goes right into it, and, and he's a guy that I think is among the elite of baseball managers, and we're, the Tigers organization is lucky to have him. Hell, I don't care, man. I, I'll engrave a, a gold encrusted garbage can for him if he wants it. I don't give <laughs> a shit. Do what you got to do, baby. I don't care. Bring a winner back because there's no better place. I mean, you saw it firsthand. I think the game you went to was a Saturday was a loss. If you went Sunday, yeah. it was it was a better opportunity. But you saw it firsthand when the Tigers hit, and it's a nice, lovely evening. It's a fun place to be with a loud vibe. You know, absolutely, most definitely. Look, I don't believe Chris Illich, and I won't believe Chris Illich until I yeah. see it. At this point, he's he's got a – this is like a show-me state, right? Like, this should be Missouri because he's got to show me because I just don't believe him. This is the same guy who basically initiated a, a teardown in the middle of 2017, which gave you a, a team that, that tied for uh, the worst record in Major League Baseball. Followed that up with, with 2018, which gave you a, a team that finished in the bottom five of MLB which then gave you a team in, in 2019, which showed some flashes at, at, at sometimes, but not not really anything. Uh, you had a chance to, to, to trade a guy like Michael Fulmer uh, before he had to have Tommy Johns and said you sat on him. And this team ended up suffering the most home losses that season in the modern era of, of all of baseball, which then leads you to 2020. And again, this team faded down the stretch. Look like trash, and they were what? Bottom third of the league? So, look, I think what you have here is you've got A.J. Hinch, who is, like we've already discussed, the MVP of this team. 
AJ Hinch, I think, has restored some faith into what Alavila is doing uh, as far as Chris Illich is concerned. Now, as far as Chris Illich is concerned, I don't believe he's spending money until he goes out there and puts his puts his money where his mouth is. And I'm kind of in lockstep with you. You need you need you need a shortstop. Absolutely, you need a shortstop. I like you said, I was there on Saturday. I watched their current shortstop make misplay after misplay after misplay. Not errors, but the guy couldn't get the ball to first base. Ball would die before it would get to first base. So there were like three double plays that they couldn't turn. I would say I think they ended up losing like six to one that game. Uh, I think or six to two. I think was the final. I would say four of the runs that were scored in that blow up sixth inning for Matt Manning was because the shortstop just couldn't turn double plays. He he was good for one out, but he couldn't get two. So it's one of those things where, yes, shortstop, number one on the list, address that. Get somebody in here. Get somebody in here who's good and can possibly bring somebody else in here, kind of like your Pudge Rodriguez. Go out there, address a pitcher who is a stud. You need a another stud at the top of this rotation. You don't need guys like Tarek Skubal, uh, Casey Mize, insert whoever else going out there trying to be the ace of this of the staff and blowing out their arm if you remember when justin verlander was brought up he had guys like kenny rogers to kind of learn behind there were guys in front of him where they kind of took that load off his shoulders go out there get a stud pitcher have him locked up for you know four or five years so those guys can kind of mentor behind him don't have to be the guy to to carry the weight in and possibly wreck their arms and then after that, let's reevaluate reevaluate where we're at as far as the salary goes and try to find a, a middle of the lineup bat that hits for some power and hits for a solid average. You would be disgusted if you sat down and looked at the batting average of this team. Uh, I think Scope is probably Ooh. your best hitter and Haas is probably your best hitter. Those are the two best guys you have. You've got the arbitrage of, of Miguel Cabrera who, look, he's – Hitting a little bit, but it, it's still his average is, is pathetic compared to what it was. Uh, there's nobody on this team that really hits in uh, above 300 or anywhere close to it, and and that is that's tough. There's you can look at this lineup, and I don't think anybody strikes fear in you. So those are my three positions that I have to address in that order. It is it is basically it's up the middle, and you need a power bat. So you you're gonna need a uh, shortstop pitcher, and then give give me a bat that hits for some power. But until he does it, I don't believe him. Okay, things are turning around slowly, but the one thing that we have an opportunity to pay attention to now is Casey Mize, the pitchers, Tariq Skubal, Riley Green, you got Spencer Torkelson, now the new draft pick. So there's a lot of things to pay attention to. And look, for Daniel Norris, you're going to be a member for that bus. It was cool. But your time in Detroit has now ended. Best of luck to you. It was, you know, basically a dump in terms of the fact that, you know, too much inconsistency led to his demise. And I thought that he was going to provide a little bit more than he did. But so long. See ya. Sayonara. Now, before we get out of here, I have to get your sense of the moves the Pistons made. Because after the draft, I think that a lot of people really got butt hurt that Troy Weaver moved on from Mason Plumley. I mean, the one thing with Piston fans that I find is that y'all are loyal to these guys, and Troy Weaver's like, ah, oh, see you, 8 million, bam, bam, we saved it. Now, I'm not exactly sure about the Canadian connection going on here with all these free agents coming in from Canada. I don't know if they got the uh, basketball secret of life going on, but the free agent moves round out what I think will be a nice year for rookie Kate Cunningham. Now, do I expect them to make the postseason in the East? No, not expectations, but I think they're going to compete. I think you're, you're going to see the Pistons continue to build upon what you saw this year and maybe, you know, get to 30 wins, 35 wins and be on the doorstep of the number eight seed. Maybe the number nine seed might be the ceiling, but it's, it's the East. You know, it's not like it's, it's going to take a whole heck of a lot to get to the playing game, you know, so I'm not you know, uh, uh, ultimate Pistons hater in regards to, you know, getting pissed at Troy Weaver for moving on from Plumlee and, and the free agent moves that he made. I think he did a good job. I think Troy Weaver ha- has shown that he can identify talent and he's looking for people. And hey, if you hire John Beeline and he says, get Garza and get Isaiah Livers, even though I was like, seriously, Big Ten connection. But John Beeline's job is to teach these guys to continue their progress in shooting. 
So what better place to go than the Big Ten? Because John Beeline knows these guys. And I think, to be honest, guys, cue up the tape here. I'm going to be complimentary. Isaiah Livers is a project I think the Pistons should really look at. If this guy can come in, maybe you get 70% of what Duncan Robinson is. If you get a little bit of that shine, then maybe you get a guy that can come in and just spot up shoot threes. So I like the second round picks of Garza and Isaiah Livers. So I'm impressed. I, I give the Pistons over the last year an A plus over what they've done. I can't find a move where it's head scratching where I go, well, I'm not down for it other than one move. And that could be a big one. Killian Hayes might be the stain that is going to haunt Troy Weaver, but it's yet to be determined because now you've got such an outlier in Kate Cunningham that if he gets you 15 points and it's exciting, I think the Pistons are on the verge of something good, baby. The buzz is there. What do you think? I was impressed by by what they did with the draft, and I think the moves that they made in free agency are extremely low-key, but I think they're going to help this team out. The, the move to get rid of Mason Plumley was a complete head-scratcher on draft day. I was like, you gave up a guy who gave you some solid minutes, and you moved back in the draft and gave up a higher draft pick? How is this working out? Then it turns out that you go out and you get a guy like Kelly Olynyk. And I think Olenek is an upgrade over Mason Cro- or Mason, Plum- Mason Plumley. And I think what you're getting there is uh, a guy who can kind of stretch the floor a little bit, help space the floor a little bit for a guy like Cade Cunningham. And look, don't be surprised if Killian Hayes becomes more of a, of a two guard instead of your point guard. Uh, I look for uh, Cade Cunningham to basically be the main ball handler here. I think what you're going to get is you're going to get Cade Cunningham getting Killian Hayes in position to get open shots, and he'll be taking those shots, or they'll be working off of each other. And I think what will happen is it'll make them a little bit more of a dynamic duo up top. Um, and I think what you have down low, by by moving on from a guy like Mason Plumley, you get a guy like Kelly Olenek in here who, like I said, can give you some some space away from the basket. So if they do want to drive or if they do want to do some pick and roll, uh, you've got that. Uh, he's a guy who can play as a wing, and you can kick the ball out to him, and he's got a, a decent uh, mid-range to the three-point game where he can spot up and then hit a couple shots for you. I think everything that they have done has kind of put them in a position where they're not beholden to anybody right now a lot of these contracts that they're signing are are two maybe three-year deals some guys are coming back on one-year deals and what that tells you is that this team is still evolving it's not where Troy Weaver wants it so you've got contracts that you can easily move on from and you can trade at the at the deadline next year if they're not winning I think this team will compete and will contend for a playoff spot Um, I think they'll probably compete and contend for that play-in game I don't know if they win anything, but I think they will compete and contend for that. But I think what you've got is you've got a general manager who's out here playing chess while you've got other people playing checkers, and he's so many moves ahead of everybody else. It's nuts. It's kind of like a Jedi master, and I think you just need to sit back and just watch in awe. He's doing a fantastic job. Nice. I can't wait for Pistons, baby. We should get out there more, huh? Pistons, I think, are a team that has a lot of buzz and things like that. I think that there's going to be an opportunity to have a lot of buzz around the Pistons and and things like that. So I think that there's going to be a lot of competition between the Wings, Pistons, Lions, and Tigers for people's attention as these teams rebuild. And now we get to start evaluating to say, okay, the garden has been seeded. The the stuff has been planted. Now, because it's the fun part, we get to see – what the fuck is going to come of all of this fruit? Is it going to be tasty and ripe or sour as shit and all rotted out? So let's find out because you know what I think a lot of fans are fearful of? The worst thing that can happen to a garden is a fucking rabbit comes in and takes all your food. And all these guys like Kate Cunningham and Casey Mize, Panay Sewell, when their time comes to produce at the highest level, they're going to be like, show me the money and head on out. So let's hope that's not the case because Detroit – deserves to earn the fruit of their labor but pay, always pay attention let's see if when the dollar signs are there and needed to be given out do these athletes now because we're getting a lot of high picks you're seeing a lot of top 10 picks flow through detroit i can't wait to see how many of them stay and earn their big contracts and stay in detroit so great podcaster man that 45 minutes flew by Make sure to follow Adam on Twitter at AdamRSTROZ. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. 
Make sure anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast, we are available. Type in Detroit Sports Podcast, and when you see that beautiful Old English D, hit that subscribe button, and all our daily content will find you. And you can get content related to Michigan, all Detroit sports, professional wrestling. Adam and Brendan Riley do a great podcast called The Practice Squad each and every Friday. Thanks, cause I look forward really, really to next week's broadcast.